Well, hello YouTube, it's me, Fortmaster, and welcome to a new reaction, and yeah, this one's a little different. So if you saw, a while ago, I put out a reaction to a video by Super Eyepatch Wolf called The Cruelest Video Game, and in it, he talks his way through a video, a video game called Fear and Hunger, with very cruel game mechanics, where you can lose limbs, um, and you have to manage both hunger and sanity, and there's this weird world where like you can have people merging with with like zombies call, making a new being called marriage and you're fighting gods trying to take their place as gods it was very weird and the i, I the game intrigued me not intrigued me enough to actually play it because again i'm not a masochist but it it started it started sending out those little signals where i sometimes get where i'll find out about a video game or like this world uh like in a book or a movie or something like that and i start getting hungry for lore and i want to find out more about it because super eye patch wolf went more into the the game experience and the way it felt playing it and stuff like that uh, as opposed to anything about the actual game world itself this uh, this whole like hunger for lore has happened multiple times for me um, in fact, like, I, one that I'm currently going through, uh, is, like, something for, like, uh, trying, figuring out what the actual world of, like, Conan the Barbarian is. Like, I didn't realize that it takes place in, like, the far past of not even antiquity, but, like, the, the age of, like, legends or stuff like that. And, like, other things where another series I'm, I, I want to do is, like, one talking about Battletech, because I've heard, I've heard of the series before, but I don't actually know that much about the world itself. But here we are, a video by Worm Girl. What actually happens in Fear and Hunger? Story analysis and review. This was suggested to me both by a, a couple of people who watched the previous video by um, Eyepatch Wolf, but also just in like my recommended feeds after I watched that video. So evidently, uh, YouTube wants to feed my lore addiction. <laughs> so yeah, I am very excited to figure out what's going on in it with this whole game. Um, because I saw why I was looking at her channel that there's also a video for uh, basically the same thing for Fear and Hunger 2, and it is two hours long. So um, I'm not sure if I'm going to do a reaction to that because that's going to be a, a heck and a half to edit through. Um, but yeah, we'll we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. <laughs> so yeah, as always, original video is linked in the description if you haven't seen it for some reason. Corner video will lead to my Let's Play of the day, and with all that out of the way, let's get this thing started then, shall we? Fear and hunger. It's time to see if these videos were worth the recommendation. Hunger is a series that rarely tells you what's actually going on. Oh, quicksand Fans in the floor? Dark fantasy genre, or really anyone who's paid attention to any video game analysis in the past 20 years, should be familiar with this sort of storytelling. Where a less is more approach can leave the audience totally enthralled even when they have no idea what's going on. Mm -hmm. The little glimmers of understanding these stories allow make excellent bait, drawing us further in each time we catch a glimpse of the bigger picture. And the act of sitting, thinking, and puzzling out the best answers we can, or even better, discussing them with the community, can lend a sense of having a personal connection to the story. There are a lot of ways this story can go. Any or all I'm of the all the, can stuff die outside. At any time. the dungeon is wide open with many avenues of exploration, and a friend in one playthrough could be an enemy or even a victim the next. There are five endings, each of which can vary based on the player's actions, five and there endings, are a further okay. four character-specific endings. Oh, okay. There's enough to keep players puzzling over the game for weeks, if not months, the coin flip and again? until the sequel came out, none of it was necessarily canon. But come out it did. And though the story Warning, of this game takes place is in a canon. different country 400 years later, it makes it clear that several of the endings, or at least something similar to them, happened all at once. And so this analysis will explore this YouTuber's interpretation of the canonical version of events, with a disclaimer that your own understanding of the story may vary. If at any point this intrigues you enough, I highly encourage you to stop the video and pick up the game. You That's can not going to happen. I can, I can tell you that. Comments. 
Fear and Hunger tells the story of four people who have come to delve into the titular dungeons of Fear and Hunger. They each come separately and for their own reasons, but they all arrive at roughly the same time, just days after all hell has broken loose and turned a dismal prison into something unspeakably worse. Oh, okay. The four roughly fit- Here- and here I thought, like, here I thought, like, the dungeon of Fear and Hunger was something, like, ancient or something like that and, like, magical and that's why something- that's why stuff was so messed up, but no. It's like, it was just a normal dingy prison a couple days ago, and then it just went weird. Okay. Fit the description of a classic D&D adventuring party, but Vox Machina this is not. Fear and Hunger is not interested in that sort of larger-than-life character-driven story, where everybody's got a role to play in saving the world. It's more like something your metalhead friend would drop on you after smoking weed and watching Begotten too many times. <laughs> okay. Most of these people are going to die, and you are going to watch them do it. Oh, wonderful. When starting a new game, the player chooses one of the four and goes through a short choose-your-own-adventure style backstory. The consequences of these choices are mostly minor, affecting starting equipment or skills, but all characters can forego two of their rewards in order to acquire the dash skill, which roughly doubles walking speed outside of combat. Oh, okay. As the game includes both enemies that will pursue the player and a time-sensitive goal, this is generally recommended for new players. Oh, okay. Regardless of who and what they choose, the player finds their avatar arriving at the dungeon's gates. An open portcullis marks the obvious entrance, but there's also a side door and an open area filled with a lot of interesting things to examine. If the player spends more than a few seconds looting the boxes and barrels scattered around the place, or worse, goes through the front door, they'll be set upon by a large pack of larger hounds and almost certainly torn to pieces, not even a full minute after completing their character history. Oh, great. The sound of the dogs as they approach, snapping and snarling, is enough to set your teeth on edge, and seeing their furry bodies charging out of the mist for the first time is a unique experience. Hmm. Most players will eventually learn to go through the side door. A few will learn that this is not the game for them, and probably a smaller number will learn how to somehow defeat all the dogs without taking damage. Although there's no reward for doing so. Yeah. These are all correct all right, answers, No experience points in this game. And the dog's placement at the very beginning of the game serves to perfectly signpost what's to come. The game is never going to stop being like this. The dungeon, as it turns out, is not simply named after one of the game's major mechanics. All who enter find their strength and willpower supernaturally drained by the oppressive atmosphere of the place, and as the player enters, it quickly becomes clear that food is going to be a problem. Mm -hmm. Until quite recently, this place was a functioning prison. Now, the candles have gone out, half-eaten meals spoil where they've been left on the tables, and unearthly creatures float like jellyfish above the corpses that litter the floor. Jeez, the idea. In terms of gameplay, Kahara is the rogue of the group. He's good at running away, he can steal, he can pick locks, and physically, he's just kind of in the middle. Kahara is the first of the four to encounter what remains of the dungeon's guards. Something has warped them to huge, misshapen brutes, charging anything they see with massive meat cleavers in a violent parody of their former occupation. Again, giant, blocked out square. Why? Why was that a necessary game decision? Unfortunately, chopping off limbs and protecting the dungeon isn't the only thing they have in mind. This is another point where I expect a lot of players will choose to find something else to occupy their time. Jarring subject matter aside, fighting the guards is initially an exercise in frustration. Fear and Hunger treats every fight like a boss battle, and most enemies have multiple body parts which may be individually targeted and destroyed. Yeah, I remember These that. These will often each get a turn of their own to perform attacks, cast spells, or occasionally pull off special moves that prompt the player to call a coin toss. Success generally means dodging the attack, while failure can lead to an immediate loss. The guard's cleaver attack will casually chop off your character's arms, yeah. and their other hand has one of these instant death coin tosses. They'll also occasionally attack with their stinger, and even if all these parts are sliced off, they can still tackle for a healthy chunk of damage. What do you mean by stinger? Like, is that literally just a special move, or is that a, a, a little bit more literal? New players will often try attacking different limbs only to discover that they're doomed no matter what they do. Each enemy is a puzzle. In the case of the guards, the ideal solution is simply to avoid them. But failing that, the order of operations is to attack their left arm, then guard, which automatically passes the coin flip attack, then hit the stinger, then the torso, guard again, and hit the torso twice more. This will often win the fight without taking any damage. Oh, okay. It isn't this simple with every enemy, but once you understand what the game is asking of you, it goes from impossible to merely difficult. Again, I'm still thinking of um, Eye Patch Wolf's thing where you just, you lay out bear traps in front of them to break their legs so you can stab them in the head. Ugh. Unfortunately, Kahara was not informed of this. Mm. He's probably captured and left in a cell to rot. Oh, okay. So that's that's canon that he was Thank captured, okay. He's on a quest for enlightenment, 
an obvious choice for one bearing the enlightened soul. Raised in the vicious tradition of the Dark Priests, who venerate the old gods in exchange for magical power, he is a man who has set aside all concepts of morality in search of knowledge. Okay. While attempting to ritually sacrifice himself, he received a vision concerning a prophecy that a fair-haired man who rivals the gods in both strength and beauty will unite the warring kingdoms under one banner and bring an end to the people's suffering, and that this man could be found in the dungeons of fear and hunger. Oh! But why him, thinks Enki, and not me? And so he has his fellow priests cut him down from the cross so that he can seize the reins of destiny. I, okay, I, 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 I do like that, where it's like, he was just gonna die, have himself ritually sacrificed. And it's like, oh wait, no, there's something else I can do. Cut me down, you idiots. The gods old gods. To Enki. Wait, old gods. Oh god, is there gonna be like? So never mind. This thing is a lot is more closer to Lovecraft than I initially thought. Okay. The dark priest is physically frail, but his blood magic can burn their heads from their shoulders and stuff the souls of the departed back into their corpses to serve as his undead minions. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of fun. He makes his way to the libraries of the upper level, which are stocked with everything from children's fairy tales to tomes of arcane knowledge. Wow, okay. He also meets with other men of the cloth, who tell him much before they die. Eventually, he discovers a secret passage leading to a secluded courtyard. Here, a group of bunny masks, naked revelers who have completely lost themselves in a never-ending ritual, invite passers-by to join them seeming oblivious to the surrounding chaos. Oh, oh, what? Doing okay. Doing so will increase one's connection to Sylvian, the god of love and creation, but comes with the risk of forgetting everything and becoming a permanent part of the ritual. Oh, okay. Fear and Hunger's gods fall into two camps, the old gods and the new. While worship of the two is not mutually exclusive, Enki's interest extends primarily to the former. The old gods have existed since before time and created the world and everything in it. Their power is immense and unparalleled, and freely available to any with the will to wield it, so long as they can pay the proper price. Okay. We're initially introduced to four of the old gods. There are others, though some are obscure, or at least initially irrelevant. Grogroth, the destroyer of- <laughs> What? what? Why does this game require so much censorship? I mean, why? <laughs> like, why did he design it like this? Men, despite embodying death and decay, is no, not a this... malicious god. Rather, his role is to clear space for new things to flourish and grow. His followers receive fearsome attack magic and the ability to create and control the undead. Okay, it's said that he's a nice. curious god, frequently walking the earth in the guise of a mortal. Sylvian, oh. his antithesis and wife, is the god of creation, fertility, and love. It was... Why the head? I thought in in what in um in iPad, Super Eyepatch Rules video, it was just like the head of a fish or something, wasn't it? So let me look this up and see if this was actually necessary. Yeah, I mean, you don't have to censor that. That's just like a bug's mouth up there. I mean, the... Oh, okay, yeah, maybe those, the pointy boobs? Weird, okay. I, I didn't even see that when I first saw, okay. It's she who created humanity. But eventually she came to realize that her creations could never love her like she loved them. And she has since grown distant. Oh, Regardless, okay. Regardless, her followers can still tap into potent healing magic. Again, you really wonder whether or not it's even physically possible for like a being such as a human to love on the scale as that of like basically an elder god. <laughs> well, not basically, literally. The God of the Depths is a little-known entity worshipped by the desperate and forgotten. God of it the Depths? It has dominion over vermin and carrion birds, and unsurprisingly, its influence is strong within the dungeons. Yeah, I would suspect. For millennia, the old gods held sway over the world, which was dominated by the cruelty of the strong. But just over 15 centuries ago, a man named Al Mur was born to a virgin mother in the holy city of Jataya. He gathered 12 apostles and traveled the land, spreading teachings of a new world order. Eventually, the sultans and kings of the eastern sanctuaries, threatened by his growing influence, executed him by crucifixion. This would prove to be their undoing, as upon dying, Almer achieved divinity, joining the ranks of the old gods and sparking an uprising that saw the corrupt rulers slain. Jesus! It's Jesus! <laughs> it's Jesus! He is among us! <laughs> so, Jesus is in this game? I, I didn't see that one coming, okay. Thus began a new era, 
with Olimar becoming the primary figure of worship and his teachings becoming the basis for the laws of many of the kingdoms of the world. But as with the gods who had come before him, Olimar's influence began to fade, and the great kingdoms which had prospered under his teachings crumbled over the centuries. Of course. In the ninth century, a new pantheon came to prominence. Though it failed to push Almer out of favor in the Western world, its deities would once again create a new world order. These gods were called the Endless, the Enlightened, the Dominating, and the Tormented. And their influence, more direct and personal than the gods who'd come before them, would bring humanity out of antiquity and into the Middle Ages. Oh, okay. This is inarguably a little confusing, which may be why Heverainen has provided all myrrh. An obvious analog for Christ is a way to orient ourselves. In real life, Christianity yeah. brought the world away from the monolithic and implacable gods of the pagan world to something more relatable. Like many things in Fear and Hunger, this is a polarizing creative decision, which nonetheless serves a useful narrative purpose. I'd never thought of, that, of it like that before. Yeah, I guess. Hmm. Okay. The role Jesus plays in real-life Christianity is quite similar to Olimar in the story. By making humanity the central focus of the religion, rather than the forces of nature, people are better able to relate to the divine. The same can be said of religions like Islam or Buddhism. These faiths yeah. are very different from each other, and this is a gross oversimplification, <laughs> yeah. but all three seek to pass down a system of morality via an aspirational central figure who best exemplifies the belief system. In contrast, most ancient religions, especially Old World Paganism, tend to use their gods as a way to explain the world around them. Thunder is the sound of Thor's hammer. The tide moves by the will of Poseidon. These implacable entities may love humanity, but they are remote and in many ways unknowable. So the old gods, including Almer, are clear allusions to real world religion. Huh, yeah, I can, I, I, how do you set it up? That's actually, that's a really cool, like, al not al allegory, um, similarity. I don't know what you call, but that's, that's really cool that looking at it that way. Very cool, okay. What is harder to see is exactly how the new gods play into things. Mm -hmm. Only two of our protagonists are religious, and while one follows all of the old gods, the other is a devout worshipper of Almer. And from her, we learn that this is still the dominant religion in Rondon. Okay. In the dungeons, we find only a single statue of the new gods, while the old gods are venerated everywhere. So who are they, and how did they bring about a new world order? So much of this game is inspired by Kentaro Miura's Berserk, and oh. the idea of a quartet of shadowy figures who remake the world without ever stepping into center stage is likely drawn from the God Hand, who operate in a similar fashion. Okay, sure! Ragnavaldr the Outlander comes from the kingdom of Oldegard, a frigid land to the north that produces advanced ships and sturdy warriors. Oh, okay, so now we're moving on to the next character, okay. I forgot, I forgot that we were following them. At a young age, he joined an expedition across the Western Ocean to the continent of Vinland. Vinland? Hoping to find treasure, the crew only met with madness. The entire continent was under the sway of the God of the Depths, blanketed in an unnatural darkness that infected the minds of the crew and nearly drove them all to kill each other. Ragnar okay. was one of the few to escape, and all the expedition had to show for its effort was a strange artifact, the Cube of the Depths. Cube of the Depths. Tragedy would okay. come again when a mercenary that doesn't sound the knights of the Midnight all. Sun struck deep into Oldegard in search of the cube. Once again, Ragnavaldr survived, but his wife and son did not. It may be that Ragnavaldr's tormented soul is the source of his unhappy luck, seemingly keeping him alive only to further his suffering. Oh, great. Shortly after returning from Oldegard with the cube, the Knights of the Midnight Sun would take part in a coup against the monarch of Rondon, an act which ended in failure, with the knights and their leader, Lagard, taken prisoner in the dungeons of fear and hunger. Ah, okay. And so Ragnavaldr pursues him, intent on avenging his family and reclaiming the cube. Armed with a bow, he can damage enemies the before cube. engaging in combat, and he boasts the highest attack power of the four protagonists, allowing him to excel in melee combat as well. The Outlander follows in Enki's footsteps, only stopping to strike down a guard and pick up a weapon or two. Everywhere, he encounters signs of the same influence that corrupted Vinland, a hateful darkness that takes root in the land and slowly begins to propagate. What is that? This door was sealed until recently, when someone dispelled the magical lock. Inside, Ragnavaldr finds a hexen table, a special altar built to channel divine power. While the man has little use for gods, old or new, he knows he'll need better weaponry to deal with the evil that lurks in this place. So he places his spear atop the table and passes a soul stone over it, imbuing it with a powerful curse. For fighting the ghosts! Dars Catalyst is Lagarde's closest lieutenant. Oh, Lagarde! Once the Holy Knight of Rondon, she grew disillusioned with the greed of the nobility, who spoke of religious ideals while sending their armies to pillage and conquer for personal gain. 
Charmed by the guard's charisma and ability, she left her order to join his company of mercenaries, the Knights of the Midnight Sun. The company made quite a name for itself, and in time, Darce realized she had fallen in love with her captain. Uh, of course. When his rebellion failed and he was captured, she decided to risk everything on a solo rescue mission. So that's why she's Despite going in there. Despite being second in command, Darce bears the dominating soul, which has a tendency to draw people to her, but also to blind her to her own flaws. Ah, okay. She makes her way through the eastern side of the dungeon, fighting past the guard. Actually, wait a second. I'm, she said this a couple times. What does this mean by, like, dominating soul or something like that? Are, are different types of souls just a thing in this? What What does that mean? Okay, well, I'm going to be lost if this keeps going on. Let me just look this up. Uh, Fear and Hunger series, human souls can be of diverse types. They are decided at the time of one's birth and are indicators of how one's personality and life will be like, oftentimes being the source of a person's skills. Soul types are the fear and hunger equivalent to real life zodiac signs, though birth signs are still mentioned and confirmed to exist. So, okay, so they're like, like a form of zodiac sign, but actually matter. Okay. That answers that question. Guards until she reaches the cells on the third level. But Lagarde isn't here, only a scruffy Easterner who introduces himself as Kahara. Oh, they found her. He seems happy to be released, but as soon as she turns her back on him, he's gone, and her purse feels a little lighter. Oh, great. Really? Guards decides to head up to the first floor, traveling through a sewer heaped with rotting corpses along a river of knee-deep blood. Oh, wait, this was that one path that if you get messed up by the guard, you find that guy... That's just a floating head, and there's that monster comes crawling through the past. This game is weird. <laughs> it seems preposterous that so many people could have met their end here. Even as large as this place is, the cells could never have held them all. It would seem that Rondon's non-stop warfare has been fueling this place with fresh victims for whatever abominable rituals are taking place here. Great. Finding her way out of the blood pit, Darce manages to surprise Torture, the torturer with the world's unlikeliest name. Despite his threats, she easily dispatches the frail little man. Not far down the hall, she discovers the person he'd been looking for. Lord Ludwig Buckman, the Crown Prince of Rondon. Oh, okay. Buckman is part of an adventuring party that arrived here a few days prior. And he's already beginning to snap. Oh, wonderful. Though the man would have okay. been Darce's enemy on the battlefield, the politics of the outside world hardly seem relevant now. She invites I him to join imagine. her, but he's too frightened to explore the darkness any further. Fair enough. Lagarde isn't in the torture chambers either, but she does find somebody else. Locked in a small cage like an animal, a little girl in a ratty black dress cowers away from the torchlight. She's clearly been here for a very long time. She won't, or can't, speak, but the knight's heart is moved by the pitiful sight. She quickly unlocks the cage and coaxes her out. Oh, okay. No place is safe in the dungeon. Letting an innocent child remain here would be unconscionable, and leaving is impossible. Okay, just... What little I know of this game, I can't help but wonder why a little girl would be put into a cage like that? Even if, even with this whole prison being absolutely horrible, I, I, was she put in there for a reason? Oh, I don't like the thought of that. So the only choice is to bring her along. There's no telling what horrors the girl has seen or experienced here, but Darce can offer one small comfort. There was a strange little doll back in Kahara's cell. It's a creepy looking thing, and the fact that it bears a passing resemblance to the guard is unsettling. Oh, okay. But the girl is astonished to receive it, as though the simple gesture is the first kindness she's received in a very long time. Oh. The circular stairs That's that really descend sad. into the lower levels of the prison are locked up tight. If the guard is still alive, he must be held down there. And so there's only one way to go. I think. Kahara finds that the mists still prevent his escape. He's just about given up on his goal. No prize is worth what he's already experienced, and only torment and death await below. Yeah. All he has to do is bide his time and flee with whatever he can once the weather turns. The knight's purse is a if good it start, turns. but surely there's something else here. The elevator carries Darce and her little companion down to an impossibly vast cavern. Cave gnomes, gnarled little gremlins that attack anything they can find with their sharp teeth, flit around like bats in the dark, oh, and their rancid eggs litter the floor. Ugh. The cave mother is deceptively easy, 
Attacking its chest will stop the cave gnomes from showing up, but it's usually just faster to destroy the wings, as this will end the battle no matter how many adds there are. Oh, that's, oh, that's freaky. The little girl is not an effective fighter, but she can use items as well as anybody else, including throwing knives. In short order, the pair send the monster plummeting to its apparent doom. Okay, um, are, are, are we just not going to talk about the fact that, um, when, is that each of her, of this den mother's boobs were in fact, like, attack areas? So that means that they somehow had attacks of themselves, or were they literally, like, spitting out the little cave gnomes? Weird, I'm not thinking about this anymore, ugh, it's weird. Nursing their wounds, they continue through the dark until they spot what Darce initially mistakes to be a man. Pocket Cat is a children's fairy tale. A Krampus-like figure who steals bad little boys and girls away from their homes, stuffing them into sacks and taking them away where they'll never see their parents again. Oh, okay. So is that He's Krampus? He's a tall, thin figure with dapper clothing and yellow eyes that shine behind his wooden mask. His hand moves in his pocket as he leers at the girl. He greets the two with cheerful courtesy and makes Darce an offer. He'll buy the child, relieving her of the responsibility of her care, and in return he'll give her any number of wonderful things. Books of terrible arcane power, or a mighty claymore that makes her longsword look like a toothpick. Okay. Though she says nothing, the girl is clearly frightened of the creature. Dars is not tempted in the slightest. Book of Enlightenment! She politely declines, okay. and though Pocket Cat seems disappointed, he gives her a pleasant goodbye. Beyond the caverns, the pair are surprised to discover what appears to be a mine. Tracks have been laid for carts and stone hauled out of the tunnels in great quantities, but the work has clearly been hasty. Liberal use of explosives and a lack of regard for safety have led to the caverns collapsing in places, blocking off tunnels and making it even more of a claustrophobic labyrinth. Oh, wonderful. Dars is no miner, but to the untrained eye, none of this looks like ore. It's all just stone. No, yeah, it's just, so this looks, it's just rock? The pair continue on, sneaking past- And keep in mind, this is under a prison still! What was all of this for? It's a meditating man garbed in yellow and eventually coming to a strange village populated by subterranean oh. humanoids. Cave dweller? And of course, he needs he requires censorship as well. What is it with this with like the mutants in here and just being so averse to wearing pants? The creatures seem peaceful enough, but the place is littered with human bones piled up in homage to some dark god, suggesting they may be more fearful than friendly. At the edge of the village, a great chasm yawns open, a sheer drop into infinite darkness. Of course it looks like a mouth. Oh, wait, huge creatures lying there dormant. Oh, God, okay. Um, and again, I just, the, the, for her finding the lucky coin, I just remembered the fact that, um, uh, in the, uh... A narrow precipice bridges a gap to the lips and teeth of some enormous monster, a sight that makes Darcy's skin crawl. <laughs> he leads the girl away, but stops to check a nearby hut. Upon a profane altar rests the prize that the Knights of the Midnight Sun claimed from their campaign in Oldegard. It is the Cube of the Depths, Wait, the guard's really? prize trophy. If this is here, he can't be far. I get it, and as soon as you take the cube, all the people in the villages, the cave dwellers, are, off, are go instantly going to turn hostile. They'll just instinctively know that their magic cube is gone. She takes the cube from the altar, and as she steps out of the makeshift temple, one of the nearby dwellers raises the hue and cry. The commotion sets off the entire village, and they descend on the night with rocks and spears. Already wounded, she right. manages to slay only a few before she's knocked down. The girl tries to intervene, and though the dwellers scarcely lay a finger on her, she's too small to be of any help. Oh. Far above, Rognavalder passes through a courtyard populated by a mindless cult of bunny masks, and a oh, man who claims to be turning into a butterfly. He leaves them in peace and comes to an unnatural looking tree, which appears to have grown around a few fresh corpses. Oh, Apollo that's not, that's, uh, oh god, that's not foreboding at all. Trunk leads into a bizarre chamber formed entirely out of roots and vines. He finds that by pressing the walls in places, he can open new passageways, and the floor has weakened, permitting him access to lower levels. The influence of the darkness is strong here. Frail shapes with bloated heads wander back and forth, murmuring nonsense to themselves. Okay. Sure, these were people once, driven mad by the god of the depths. Ugh. Only one place is free of the corruption, a bare spot where a sword has been plunged into the ground. Despite an ominous sensation, the outlander grips the eastern blade and pulls it free. It has been here battling the darkness alone for a very long time. But now, it will have an ally. 
Oh, okay. He is immediately it's attacked a sentient by the sword. Of Wonderful. Owner, who wordlessly motions for him to return the blade, but it won't. Thankfully, he has a cursed spear, which can actually hurt a ghost. It won't do to leave the weapon here, nor to let its former owner remain chained in torment. He strikes the spirit with his cursed blade, severing its ties to this world and speeding it on to its final reward. With the assassin Spectre's blessing and his new blade in hand, the Outlander continues downward, hoping to honor the man's memory by using his blade to continue the war against the darkness. Oh, worthy. Further down, he encounters a gigantic heart pulsating among the vines. Oh. Without hesitation, heart? he plunges his blade into it and moves ever deeper. Oh, okay. Dropping down yet another hole, the Outlander finds himself in a catacomb swarming with biting insects. Hurts a little from the fall, great. Here, he finds another heart and destroys it. He must be close to his prey now. How many of these hearts are there? And I still have... Like, Granted, it might, it's also from the fact that, like, she's jumping around from character to character, but I still have no idea what is going on or what this game is even about. And we're halfway through the video, almost. I am, though I do have to say, I am very intrigued and very much do want to find out what's happening. He can feel it. Puzzling over his maps, Kahara comes across an unexpected sight. A village of some sort of cave people. They flee from his torchlight, but make no motion to harm him. Oh. The knight who freed him lies half-conscious on the floor as one of the cave dwellers tries to bash her head in with a rock. He wants to leave her. The cave people haven't been bothering him, and there's no reason to get involved. But something in him just can't. He slips his sword from his belt. The will of the player. And rushes in to help. The troglodyte falls before it can finish her off, but its death cry is answered by hoots and growls from the others. As always, no good deed can go unpunished. To the mercenary uh, surprise, a small child emerges from the dark and clings to Dars, trying to help her up. A terrifying presence had entered the room. Oh god, not the, the crow-headed guy thing again. Somehow, she wasn't harmed by the cave dwellers. The knight, yeah, there's something going on bruised, with the girl. still in one piece, gives Kahara her emphatic thanks, seeming profoundly shamed by her near-death experience. The trio decide to flee the now hostile village by dropping down a mine shaft, where they are shocked to discover a group of men and women in wolf masks gorging themselves on each other's flesh. Oh, what? They draw their blade, but the cannibals pay them little mind. Dars recoils in horror, but Kahara immediately understands what has happened. This must be what remains of Captain Rudimer's expedition. They came down to eliminate the source of evil plaguing the upper dungeons, and instead they fell victim to it. Starvation drove them to cannibalism, and cannibalism to Grogoroth. Like the bunny masks, they've lost their minds to the ecstasy of the feast. The ritual will last until its final celebrant has devoured themselves. Devoured? Wait, de devoured themselves? You gotta hate the old gods, they're so weird. Nobody stops them as they leave, moving blindly through the caverns until they once again find cart tracks to follow. Kahara swears he sees a figure following them, but the other two can't make anything out. Before long, the tracks come to an end, and the rough stone of the mines is replaced with pavement and masonry. It's the dungeon! Oh great, this Imagine place with the beating hearts! This place. <laughs> yeah. Swarms of vermin crawl across the floor, biting and stinging the three as they follow Dars, who practically sprints down the hall, heedless of the split-open heart bulging out of the floor or the dead guard in the hall. Yay! She follows a trail of blood to a barred door. And beyond. The guard is dead. His throat has been cut. All of this was for nothing. Oh. If only Dars had been faster. She falls to her knees, sobbing. The girl can only stare at him with an uncanny look of recognition, tears on her cheeks. Kahara scoffs. All this for nothing. He can't help but be annoyed by the dead man. What was any of this even for? Oh. Eventually, Dars pulls herself together to leave. But as she does, she encounters a strange man, who comments on Lagarde's importance and how unexpected it is that he didn't make it. He gestures at a dark corridor, suggesting the three give it a look. After all, the guard came here for a reason. Lagarde's fate is decided simply by how quickly you can reach him. 
Sleeping, fighting, having a dalliance with the bunny masks, none of that matters. If the time on your file is under 30 minutes, the man is alive. If it's over, he's dead. Wait, did... I'm forgetting. Did, did Super Eye Patch Wolf mention that? But I... Again, I... Uh, real world timer. I... Oh god, I can, I, can, that, that is, I can I can imagine there that just being so so frustrating. Oh god. Again, there are moments where like I start getting more invested and like, oh man, I, I maybe I actually do want to play this. And then there are other times like this where it's like, okay, several steps back, no I do not. Which is the canon outcome is a matter of debate. But due to the mutual exclusivity of certain confirmed canon events if things go otherwise, Lagarde's death would seem to be the likelier of the two. Okay. The dungeons are sacred to the old faith, a nexus where the barrier between worlds is thin. It is said to be one of the last places where a man may meet his creators, and according to the priests who now lie strewn about their own altar, a ritual is underway to bring about paradise. What exactly that means is uncertain, but Lagarde was supposed to be the key. A paradise for who, though? That's the major question. Enki digs around the corpse pile until he pulls his prize free. A severed head. The funny dancing men are yellow mages, cultists of this head, the great wizard Nasra, who are here to do their master's bidding. Oh, so that that's the head. Oh, wonderful. Okay, great. They were until Enki killed them. The floating head can't help but laugh at his moxie. And once Enki explains that he had a vision that enlightenment awaits him in the depths, Oh God, the Nasra monster's coming. Nasra agrees to take him on as a pupil. Oh, and Nasa he's a party a member. Fantastic party member. He's also incredibly foul-mouthed and will roast, sometimes literally, the hell out of a lot of the characters that you encounter. Oh, what? Hundreds of years ago, Nasra was known as the doom and terror of modern man. He's a villainous wizard in the mold of Vecna or Abdul Alhazred, and though he and his cult venerate Grogoroth, it's entirely transactional. The Yellow Mages believe in serving only insofar as it advances their aims, hating all gods and kings but themselves. Oh, okay, Sh sure. As he wanders the cavern, smashing nomegs, he hears the snarl of a cave wolf. So now we're back with the barbarian. The six-eyed creature has a mouthful of razor teeth, but the outlander senses a certain nobility in her bearing. She's a creature of the dark, but unlike so many others, she's held on to her sanity. He throws her some old meat, and in short order, the two are the best of friends. He names her Moonless, and the two travel the caverns, striking down evil and marking their territory wherever they go. Oh! Party the member. mother, as it turns out, survived its encounter with Dars. Great. And, okay, no wings, but its boobs are healed. Okay. Great. Wingless, it charges Ragnavaldur in the dark, but he strikes it down with a single stroke of his eastern sword. Near the village of the Dwellers, they encounter the Salmon Snake, a gigantic axolotl that may as well be a dragon. Gigantic axolotl? Okay. Ragnavaldur distracts it with a few of the remaining gnome eggs, while Moonless gets into position and tears out its eye. Gnome eggs? Blinded, the creature is no match for eastern steel. The Salmon Snake is deceptively easy, especially if you have two party members. If you have a soul stone, killing it will grant the Salmon Snake soul. An accessory that prevents bleeding and limb loss. That? Well, I mean, in a game where having limbs cut off is a major... Uh, like a major mechanic? Having something that just completely mitigates that, that's, that sounds like awesome, okay. The pair Wait a second, is that because it's a giant axolotl and axolotls regrow limbs? Huh, okay. Eventually bump into Enki and Nasra at the home of an alchemist who has taken up residence in the caverns. While the outlander is initially skeptical, Nasra has a plan that's simply too good to pass up. And what is that? Kahara follows along after Dars as she approaches the great doors and raises the cube. He tries to convince her to turn back, but she won't hear it. This had to mean something. The doors swing open, revealing a much older set of catacombs with unfamiliar architecture. Of course, the, the whole dungeon was built on some sort of like ancient temple or something like that. Great. Oh uh, god, we're gonna- the game's gonna end with them having to kill, like, one of the- the Elder Gods or something, isn't that? That's gonna be it, and then they're gonna become the new Elder God, because the essence can't be destroyed, and just the body can be, or something like that. I- I know that's what's gonna be happening here. The three evade the undead and defeat a multi-armed insect creature before finding their way through, 
only to discover Body something snatcher. impossible. Body snatcher. There's an entire city buried down here. We have the city, right? The place is shrouded in darkness and fallen into ruin. They all recognize it. It's Mahab, city of the gods, the place where people wander in their dreams. They make their way down the cobbled streets until they encounter a large, hairy creature dragging a half-dead knight away into the darkness. So, they just... Is this something they just instinctually know the name of this place? Okay, that's... That's weird. I'm saying- I get, I've been saying that that su stuff has been weird in this a lot in this video, okay. Sarah gets a sinking feeling in his stomach as he once again finds himself playing hero. The monster speaks briefly about needing to capture people for its master, but the devil Lord doesn't remember who it serves or what its purpose is beyond that. Soon, it lies dead on the cobbles. The knight is Jean. She's badly wounded and has lost an arm, but she's alive. Oh, okay. Jean is a member of Lord Buckman's party. She was searching for Captain Rudimer when she fell in battle and was captured. Nobody's seen hide nor hair of the man. And one of the party, Sir Cyril, is still missing. If he could be found, what's left of Buckman's party could at least be reunited. I mean, that's good at least. Jean is gravely wounded and unable to make the trip back to her group herself. Left alone, she would not survive. Still, Darce refuses to turn back. Kahara is finally forced to admit that the woman has gone mad with grief, and he won't be able to convince her. Oh, but there's great. there's no to leave an innocent child with her. Supporting Jean with one arm, he takes the girl and leaves Darce to her lonely fate. Reunited, save for the missing Sir Cyril, Buckman's party begins to believe for the first time in days that there may still be hope for their expedition. Ragnavalder listens as Enki discusses the riddle of the divine with his new friend Nosramas. A scholar and alchemist living deep in the mines. There's something otherworldly about the man, and he's as unsettling as he is kind. 800 years ago, a group of five people known as the Fellowship, Francois, Nilvan, Valtiel, Ron Shambara, and a fifth member forgotten by history sought Mahab, the city of the gods. Fifth member. The new world order established by the ascension of Almer had failed. The world was in chaos, and their intent was to either entreat the old gods for aid, or do what Almer had done, and become gods themselves. They fought their way into the city, chasing off the servants of the old gods and eventually claiming the throne for themselves. But, as Nazra will attest, they did not become real gods. Their ascension would provide them great longevity and fantastic powers, but they'd been duped, and they weren't even the first ones to try it. Wait, what? Mahab is a place where- Is, is like, Almer one of these, like, fake gods as well? Okay. Where mortals seeking power have gone for centuries, only to be blinded, overwhelmed, and ultimately enslaved by it, carrying out the bidding of the old gods even as they thought they were replacing them. Once ascended, the Fellowship did succeed in bringing about a new world order, manipulating world events to shape human affairs according to their desires, but this age was fragile, and only a little better than the last. Eventually, it too would fall to chaos as the feudal age crumbled under the stress of plague and warfare. I mean, little steps, that's all you need. Nosramus was the fifth member of the Fellowship, and he hands Enki a trinket, something to remind himself of who and what he is, a soul anchor should he ever face the Divine. Okay. Leaving Nosramus to his studies, the two men, the Floating Head and the Cave Wolf, make their way to the catacombs and are surprised to find the doors to Mahab open. The, I, the, the Floating Head? That, that's just such an odd sentence. The ruined streets are quiet, and save for a few signs of violence, they see no one. Mm hmm. They're not Ragnar in the lead. Ragnar is shocked to discover that the cube of the depths has been left in the slot on this machine. He reaches out to touch it, and with a flash of green light, the four find themselves above ground. The city of Mahab spread out around them in all its former splendor. Above ground? Well, I guess, again, like talking, like, I forgot what video it was, but it was talking about, like, archaeology in, like, London and how stuff, like, if you want to get to, like, Roman age like settlements in like London and stuff like that, you have to go nine meters underground. I mean, if you have like this ancient city it, that's literally been buried to the point where you can have several like dungeons built on top of it to actually reach it. Or did it sink because of like the gods or something like that? Is it, are we doing dealing with like an Atlantis situation here? The late afternoon sun offers no heat as it beats down on the golden city and the townspeople are no more than shadows. This feels it's more like, like an drink. illusion than the real thing. Or perhaps it's a little bit of both. Okay. 
They head down the streets of the past, scaling a tower that eventually takes them to a chamber with a large bed. As though compelled by the hazy atmosphere, they doze off and are overwhelmed with an intense shared dream. And it, what is it? Feverish dream. This is the capital city of Rondon. In contrast to Mahab's gilded towers, it's a muddy, miserable place, and something about it feels warped and alien. Mm -hmm. Finding themselves in a brothel, they witness an interaction between a man named Kahara and a woman named Celeste. Celeste is a sex worker, and it turns out she's pregnant. Though Kahara has always prized his freedom above everything else, for once he feels compelled to take responsibility. There's a job, he says, and it's dangerous but it pays enough that the two could leave their uncertain occupations and settle down to raise a family together. Celeste worries for Kahara's safety, but she knows better than to try talking him out of it. Are these two the little girl's parents? And something happened where it ended up she was trapped in the dungeon or sent there? What is going on? The vision fades. The two were only phantoms, a part of the dream. They next find Enki crucified, not for any crime, but rather out of ennui. It's a ritual sacrifice. The man has learned all that he can through his studies and found nothing, so he consigns ennui. himself to Almer. Jeez, okay. But at the last minute, he sees a vision. The new gods whisper in his ear. What he seeks can be found in the depths, and so he has his priests release him, and he's gone. Not far away, the very same priests claim that salvation is coming. Hmm, is it now? Stepping over a few plague victims, the group leaves by the gate and find themselves in a familiar battlefield in Oldegard. A pit grows in Ragnavaldr's stomach as he watches himself on that awful day when he came home to discover that the Knights of the Midnight Sun had massacred the people of his village who oh. fought to the last to protect the cube he now carries. Within the Outlander's home, they find only inky blackness and an old woman spinning thread. After a moment, oh. she explodes into movement her body unfolding into some kind of articulated murder machine. Okay. They manage to dispatch the skin granny and are confronted with a final pair of visions. Skin granny, okay. The guard, who believes that he has prophesied to bring about a new age, and Dars, who, despite her doubts, is willing to place her faith in her beloved and whatever he's planning. A half-nude woman descends toward the group, radiating brilliant white light. She is Nilvan the Endless, one of the new gods. She tells them that the time of the new gods is at an end, and that mankind was unable to break free from the old gods' influence. Now it's time for the new new gods. <laughs> and we'll get a couple hundred years out of that, and it'll be the new 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 gods, and just it'll just keep going on that until we're gonna have to like, like ultra new or something like that. We're gonna have to figure out a new name for them, unfortunately. Something bigger and better is required. Bigger and better than becoming a god. She asks if- Well, then again, she- it was said that they're not, like, true gods. They've basically become, like, puppets of the old gods, even subconsciously. Little rubs her swollen belly. The group agree to see her child, a girl, lost somewhere in the dungeon to safety, down into the heart of darkness. She trusts her own soul to the men, hoping they can use it to accomplish what the Fellowship could not. Oh, so the girl... So she's the daughter of one of the new gods. Okay. Ho. Oh. They certainly haven't seen or heard of any child, but in an instant, Lagarde's plan is made clear. Lagarde must have intended to gather the souls of the four new gods in the hopes of combining them with his own, creating something more than they were in his ascent. To Natra, the idea seems patently moronic. It would mean climbing into the trap that the old gods had laid for ambitious men and expecting that this time, it was going to be different. Yeah, I guess. I mean, Einstein did say the definition of, ins of insanity is doing the same thing multiple times and expecting a different result. Though then again, that the, like, what did the new gods do? Did they just sit in the throne? Or, like, did they take, like, the souls of, like, earlier fake new gods to become... The so, I mean, if you had one person taking on, like, four, maybe that would be something new and greater? I don't know. Regardless, Ragnavaldr saw to it that no such thing would happen, and now Enki and Nasra both see an opportunity before them. 
For the dark priest, the souls may offer the key to enlightenment. For Nasra, this is just desserts. <laughs> Nasra, as it turns out, was a new god. Oh, was he? The Fellowship thought they were the first, but this too is a lie. The old gods have kept new gods as pawns for a very long time now. And just as Nasra outwitted Betel and stole his title, so too was he deposed by the Fellowship. The okay, so I was literally right. Though, they didn't say anything about him taking, like, the souls of the previous gods. So, again, might be something different. Wizard now exists as an agent of chaos, and would be glad for the chance to tear down the phony Pillars of Order while also exacting his revenge. That thing is weird. They proceed to the Grand Library, a palatial storehouse of knowledge populated by strange, artificial beings created by Valtiel, the Enlightened One. They okay. try to fashion a new body for Nasra, but Valtiel's cloning devices result only in imperfect husks. As oh. with many other things, the true secrets of creation remain hidden to the new gods. Oh, Valtiel okay, himself that's is found how that works. The library. He plunges off a deep ledge only to arise as a gigantic head that incessantly Whoa. questions the group as they fend off its magical attacks. But soon, the thing is <laughs> No dead. enlightenment, okay. And the soul of the enlightened is theirs. Valtiel died having failed to ever achieve anything like the power or understanding of the old gods, a stern warning to Enki, and a source of smug satisfaction for Nasra. Mm -hmm. Next, they track Ron Shambara, now known as the Tormented One, to an elaborate prison. By creating a clone husk and sacrificing it, they're able to summon the Tormented One from its pool of blood. Primary pain? Secondary pain? This is a two-stage fight. The first form is straightforward, but in the second stage, Ron will hook himself up to this gyroscope thing. He does massive damage, and you need to attack the outer wheels to make the inner body vulnerable. Oh wait, that is... The god sinks so into the pool, released from centuries of unknowable torment, and the group adds his soul to their collection. Mm -hmm. Now, only one god remains. They mow through a grisly collection of monsters in search of Francois, the dominating one, and find him in the present day, overseeing his kennel. But rather than the vicious warlord they'd imagined, he's a worn-out old man, well aware that he's been cousined. Oh, okay. Cousined? What? He's astonished to see Nasra in the few seconds he gets before he's incinerated. But his soul is not found among the ashes. If the Fellowship is to truly be defeated, then the group must face Francois in the past, at the height of his power. Wait, so... They're going into the past to kill him. That's... Oh, God. We're... Time travel shenanigans are going on. Oh no, the story's getting even more confusing. No! There is a little room in Mahabd where one can visit the Hall of the Gods. Here, we learn what becomes of them when they retire. They're relinquished to this room to sit, talk, and ponder eternity, no longer able to influence the world. They'll answer questions, and they really have a lot to say about a surprising number of subjects. This has been criticized as telling, not showing, and while that's true, there's very little information here that couldn't be inferred from the game proper. So, yeah, there's just, it's been just a long line of new gods. And then they get, when a new batch comes in, the old ones are just shuffled off into the side room just to watch the world unfold. Okay, wow. The hall mostly serves as a place to clarify things one might have missed, or to have your lore theories confirmed. It's funny. You, it, it, I, in like a lot of like mediums, you see it's like, oh, when a god is stopped being believed in, they'll like lose power and they'll disintegrate into nothingness. In this universe, no, they're just, they're put into a god nursing home. <laughs> the important thing is to ask them about Nasra while he's still in your party. Mr. Rest. Old fool, his mind is weak, his body. Sodomize everyone who stood. Enough. You filthy maggots. There's how I. You the golden crown. You're okay. You're still alive somehow. From the east? Oh. Okay. Disgusting. This reeks of rotten. This dude rules. Okay. All that remains is to confront Francois at the throne. This time, it's not so easy. The Francois of the past has no idea of the snare he's caught in and fights like hell to preserve his dominion. Yeah, as one would expect.
Oh, and now he's gold. Okay. Gold and limbless. But eventually, the three triumph and he lies broken on the floor. Literally. Now carrying all four souls, Enki considers the throne. Nasra predated Valtiel, and Betel came before that. It's unlikely that he was the first. The time-shifting devices mean that anyone who comes to this place seeking the throne, no matter when they do it, can arrive at this moment in the year 809. To the outside world, there's only been one set of new gods, but having met the alumni and visited the Great Hall, their numbers are clearly innumerable. Okay, so that adds just a whole nother layer to the whole thing of like old gods being replay, uh, being retired and stuff like that, where it's not like there's been a line of new gods showing up. They just overwrite the, the previous existing ones and the old ones are shoved off into this room. Wow, okay, that's... Yeah, again, time travel shenanigans, I... It never makes things easier, now does it? Wow, okay! Every so often, things get bad enough that someone comes here and does this all over again, putting themselves in a time loop and ensuring that eventually, their divine tenure will be removed from the timeline when somebody else shows up to replace them. Why else would there and be the a time machine? And the nature of is that sooner or later, this happens no matter what. Or maybe not. Some writings suggest that the first new gods ascended centuries prior. Nasra's legacy certainly wasn't excised from history, and he maintains a cult to this day. So yeah, it could, it, but it's also the fact that he still exists and isn't in the room to be like overwritten or something like that. It, again, there's some really weird thing here, and I can't decide whether it's just time travel that's the problem or bad writing. So what exactly is going on here? Yes. Ferenki. Leaving would mean turning his back on the biggest leap forward he could ever take. It wouldn't do to come this far and not try it. The Dark Priest ignores Nasra's warnings and sits on the throne. He finds himself alone in the void, a barren world far from his own. Its surface of barren grey stone is lit from within by a ghastly green glow. Just this place is what the okay. new gods call the other side of the coin, the realm of the old gods. Here, in the presence of their power, ascension is made possible. Depending on who joins you in the green, you might learn more about it. Ragnavaldr has apparently been surviving here for a very long time, though we've just arrived. If you bring Lagarde, he says it's been a century since you sat on the throne, but somehow only an eye blink for you. Wow, okay. The Void exists outside of human understanding, and probably outside of time itself. Because, of course, why... why can't... Like, humans are the center of the universe, why can't things just be normal? This is Elder God business, and it's likely the source of all the timeline confusion. We aren't really meant to gain a complete understanding of Fear and Hunger's divinity. Understanding would diminish the mystery. Yeah, so the best you can do is pick your favorite theory. I'm fond of the single time loop, but it might actually be the case that something much more chaotic is happening. Wonderful. The temporal confusion here also serves to eliminate some of the narrative pressure imposed by the canon that will be established in the sequel. If we're dealing with a time machine and an unknowable dimension outside of time, there's lots of room for multiple interpretations of this game's events to play out. In any case, Enki eventually finds his divine reflection, and in a moment he experiences centuries of divinity. In 809 AD, eight centuries before his mortal birth, he becomes a new god, the Enlightened One. <laughs> so, several centuries before I am born, I become a god. Sure. <laughs> whose terrific power and wisdom shepherded humanity out of antiquity, through the Dark Ages and into the Medieval Age. All the power is there, waiting to snare and shackle him in the same repetitive cycle that has come countless times before, mm -hmm. waiting to excise him from the timeline and keep all of humanity locked in a loop, a temporal prison to match the physical one which has become so familiar to the priest. Uh. But Enki has come prepared. He feels the soul anchor that Nosramas gave him, a reminder of who and what he is, and he turns away. Enki witnesses his own divinity, but he does not take that poison prize. Instead, he returns to the world, to his own time. Not a god, but one step closer to true enlightenment, which he has learned is not a destination, but a path without end. He Again, that picture, why does that almost look like, like it'd be on like the cover of Vogue or something? That just, it, <laughs> what is with that pose? He, Nasra, and Ragnavaldr part ways. The unlikely trio have each found fulfillment in their quests. Lagarde and his plans are in ruins, the new gods are dead, and Enki has been transformed by his brush with divinity. Like Nasramas, who has dwelled in the caverns for centuries, he has become something more than human. 
Rather than turning inward, Enki uses his wisdom for the betterment of humanity. The Dark Priest was already a respected scholar, but his treatises on the divine, known as Skin Bibles, will go on to become the definitive works of religious scholarship in the coming centuries. Skin Bibles? Oh, why did it- why did it have to be that? That's such a bad name, oh! Something has chased Kahara and the girl into the caverns. Oh, and the mouth is open! Think he knows what it is. The Crow Mauler is all that remains of Captain Rudimer, who stood up to the darkness and lost his mind. Oh, so that's what the Crow Mauler is. Okay, great. And though he's managed to blind it with a vial of acid, the monster is relentless in pursuing him, as if trying to drive the pair somewhere. With nowhere left to run, the pair take a leap off the edge of a precipice, tumbling into the open maw of some dead or sleeping creature. Yeah, so they jumped into the mouth of that thing. The pair step thing. out onto a pile of bodies, impossible in number. An entire kingdom lies dead beneath their feet. At least the Mauler hasn't pursued them, but where are they? Oh, that is, that is weird. There's going to be some sort of weird dark oh. sacrifice here or going on. I, oh God, what's going to happen? We're obviously reaching the end and seeing all the, the main like players endings. What's going to happen to this poor girl? walks to the edge of the abyss, and Kohara begins to feel uneasy. A reassuring smile. Something is happening. The sensation Something grows like until it's a gut-churning terror. Your... It's... Chills run down your spine and you feel like throwing up, but the girl seems to remain awfully calm. Oh no. Coming from the girl. Who's radiating from her? Oh no. She falls to the ground and screams, her little body twisting into impossible shapes. Kahara tries to help, but she's thrashing out of control. I look to you for help. Something's happening to the girl. She recedes briefly into the dark and rapidly stretches and grows into something new and terrible. The girl, child of Neilvan the Endless, at the wait, wait, what did that? Uh, the god of fear and hunger is born. Oh, okay, and she doesn't look like she doesn't um. The Ulmer, like the Jesus stand-in, he was like a, a person, and then, you know, they built statues of him afterwards, and she doesn't look like, like the new gods, she's, is she like turning into like an old god or something like that? What is going on? The girl, child of Neilvan the Endless, a deity now stricken from existence, and Lagarde, the dead subject of a failed prophecy, has ascended. Kahara knows none of this, but as he watches her protean body explode into different shapes, as he feels the pressure of burgeoning divinity, he realizes what he's looking at. Wait, so she was, she's the daughter of Lagarde and the goddess. Oh wait, a goddess stricken from the universe and like a failed prophecy. Gee, this is, this is like real, the, the writing in this. It is, it, it, it is simultaneously so weird and yet so fascinating. I have, I have literally never heard of anything like this before, like in a story or not. This is, is so strange. This child, abandoned and trapped in a lifetime of terror and misery, has become the ultimate embodiment of all she's ever known. The god of fear and hunger is born. The god continues to grow and change, shifting from a representation of one little girl's misery to something more. Now she's a woman. Now she's a cavernous maw, dozens of arms reaching out as she comes to embody not just the suffering that she endured, but the suffering of others. Finally, the god settles on a faceless idol, abstract and anonymous, the kind of thing that anybody could see themselves in.
Uh, okay. Sure. It spends a moment gazing at the doll given to it by Dars, reflecting on the brief glimmer of kindness that the girl received in her last days. And then it unleashes its divine energy on Kahara, who fights with everything he has. It isn't enough. It never could be. This is not one of the new gods. It's not a thing that can be fought. It's a concept with the weight of existence behind it. To struggle against it is not difficult or even impossible. It's meaningless. But Kahara does struggle, and in struggling, he suffers. That is something the newborn god understands. Yeah, this whole thing. You have... She's basically turned into, like, one of the chaos gods from, like, 40k. Like, she's turned into the embodiment of fear and hunger. Oh, God, look at what new horrible machinations are going to happen now that that's a thing. Especially... Especially with the, 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 the old new gods being erased. Or killed. Yeah, erased actually is the right word. She acknowledges him. And the weight of that acknowledgement crushes him instantly. Ragnavaldr goes on to become a legend. Not among men, but among the monsters that prowl in the dark. Who learn to fear the so-called god of ultraviolence. He god travels the world with his faithful companion hunting these creatures down for the rest of his days until in many places, their existence is relegated to the stuff of fairy tales. Well, he did a good job then, didn't he? In the libraries and laboratories of Mahabr, sleepless and on the verge of psychosis, Dars learned a secret. She was no mage, but that's okay. Someone had already done most of the work for her. She even found Sir Cyril. He'd lost a little weight, but all he needed was a mind elixir and he was good to go. Oh, okay. She could have left with him, but there was still more important work to do. Fragmented instructions here and there contained all that she needed to prepare the spell of rebirth. And now, as she spills her blood, she's easily able to perform the incantation, as if some divine hand is guiding her. Once, that might have set off alarm bells, but Dars is no longer the woman she was. She's nuts. Lagarde's corpse sheds its skin and a creature made of their intermingled blood rises from what was left of the man, calling itself a god. In the depths of the delusion, she still believes that this is her beloved, and that one day, he might feel the same. I highly she doubt it, honey. as his lieutenant, but he seems to have forgotten his lofty dreams of a new era, becoming little more than a bloodthirsty warlord. And what of Nasra? He, too, would venture to the heart of darkness. Though the old gods have left this world, their traces remain, and surely, if he has the strength to defeat the new gods at the height of their power, he can challenge the traces of Grogroth. Ah, well, nevertheless. Oh! Uh, so, so, and I fought the new gods at the height of their power! Like, okay! <laughs> so wait, they said, the old gods have left, and all that's left in this world are, like, their remnants. And he couldn't even defeat that. Jeez, and that, you have far too many eyeballs, friend. Kahara's broken body lies on the alien plains of some unknown abyss at the foot of the god of fear and hunger. He struggles to stand, yes. but for some reason, he just can't. Celeste will never see Kahara again. She and her child will face the coming of a new age, unaware of the pivotal role that his sacrifice played. Fear and hunger is a being on par with the old gods. After centuries of struggling, mankind has gained a greater deity that understands and embodies the misery of human existence. She becomes the lash that drives industry, science, and commerce, and all their accompanying evils. Thus begins what will come to be known as the Cruel Age. These aren't the only stories found in Fear and Hunger, and they likely will not be the one that your playthrough tells. There are other gods to fight, other secrets to learn, and even if we're sticking to what Termina tells us is canon, there's a lot of wiggle room here, and that's a good thing. Everyone will have a different experience with Fear and Hunger. I don't think there's any other RPG quite like it. No, I the don't think there is! The disparate story threads to merely exist in this intertwined space feels miraculous in action. So what does Fear and Hunger actually have to say? 
there's some pretty dark stuff in the plot, and certainly more than I showed. And that's given it an undeserved reputation as some sort of try-hard edgelord game for sickos. <laughs> People okay. engaging in that yeah. kind of critique certainly have a point that these elements can be especially uncomfortable for some and that players ought not to be blindsided with them. I think most people, though we'd all draw the line at a different point, might agree that gratuitous content can serve to glorify violent acts or diminish their seriousness, especially if they're handled carelessly. But something about the way that Fear and Hunger presents its content feels much more uh, like commiseration than hey. gratuity. Much like its titular deity, the game gets it. Life can be downright terrible, and one way or another, we all get a turn on the rack. Misery is something that everybody has in common, and by unabashedly embracing the darkness, these story elements can serve as a reminder that wherever you've been, somebody else has been there too. <laughs> Though the game is nowhere near as funny as its sequel, it does have its moments. The characters are simple, but they're fleshed out enough to care about. Enki, for instance, probably only has 10 or 12 lines in the entire game, but so much is suggested that it's not hard to imagine how he'd react to the bizarre situations your party runs into. Okay. Character art helps a lot with this. I mean, look at him. You know exactly what kind of guy this is. Yeah, not amused in the slightest. This game is good. It's really, really good. I've said in a review that its sequel, Termina, might be a better entry point due to its polish, but I think the original has a lot of strengths that the sequel lacks. And its impenetrability might actually add to them. If Termina is a cut and polished diamond, the first game is a meteorite made out of solid gold that crashes into your house and takes your leg clean off. Oh, okay. It's tough, yeah, but that's a one-of-a-kind experience. Yeah, I guess it would be, the yeah. The game is less than $10 on Steam or itch.io. I really hope you'll check it out, or at least go hit up the sequel, which I've done a shorter, spoiler-free review on. Thank you all, and I'll see you in the dungeon. Oh, God, and there we have it. That's... So that's the canon story, and there's apparently she's done a full story analysis of the sequel, uh, Termina, and it's two and a half hours long. I don't even want to think of how long my video is going to be after that. But, oh god, I mean, again, I, 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 get, I keep getting hung up on the girl who becomes the god of fear and hunger. You have this little girl who was... The daughter of a goddess erased from existence and a, a failed hero of prophecy whose entire life is spent in terror and misery. At which point, when she's brought to, the, uh, to a heart of darkness, she transcends and achieves apotheosis and becomes a new... Not even like just a god, but the like the embodiment of the concept of fear and hunger. At which point, the creation of that god is what allows humanity to move on from it uh, from the medieval ages onto like I I'm guessing the way when she said like industry and technology, like the industrial revolution or something like that. And it's called the cruel age. Like I would have thought that like before that would have been pretty cruel, but man, what do I know? Jeez, that this game's writing is nuts. I, I know I've said that a couple times, but it still stands. I, I honestly don't know what to make of this. And I, I'm very tempted to watch the, the analysis of chapter, of not chapter two, of the sequel. But again, that's two and a half hours long. Like, that would obviously not be a single thing. And it's also just hard to find, like, a chunk to watch, like, a two and a half hour video just because, you know, how life is. It's usually something like that. I'd have it playing in the background while I'm doing something else. But... <sighs> I... This is certainly... Certainly an impressive game, but... It is certainly different. So yeah, um, as always, original video is linked in the description if you haven't seen it for some reason. Um, corner video will lead to my Let's Play of the day, uh, and I hope you guys liked it. If you did, leave a like, subscribe if you have not, and I'll see you guys next time. <laughs> Goodbye.